Thank you so much for having me today. My presentation will hopefully remain within the time frame. Please feel free to interrupt me and, and tell me my time is up. Uh, in the presentation, I want to start by talking about some of the US demographics. And um, I've organized my presentation under some headings such as protection, engagement, community support, inclusion, medical, and funding of services, just so you know where I'm going with the top I have this slide of the US demographics so that you can see how the United States compares to South Korea in terms of demographics. As the slide shows, the percentage of people over the age of 65 has been gradually increasing as it has been around the world uh, compared to the people who are age 15 to 64. This gradual increase has allowed the United States policymakers to make policy adjustments and plans over time. Um, so we've been working on this for a long time, uh, and hopefully some of these policies will be uh, informative. Did I do that? <laughs> uh, this slide shows different levels of local government. For this presentation, I'll be focusing on some of uh, what the local governments are doing to take care of the aging population. Uh, in the United States, local governments generally include towns, cities, counties, regional areas such as collection of different counties uh, and states. And I think probably most people may be familiar with the different levels of government, but maybe not what is meant by counties. So I wanted to just describe what I meant by that uh, in more detail. So counties are a geographical, statistical, and pol political unit. They can vary in size, population density, uh, and uh, land area. But it's about 103,000 people, and the average land area is over 3,100 square kilometers, just so you get an idea of the average amount of space. All 50 United States have counties, although two states call them uh, different terms. And each level of local government has their own elected officials who are charged with making policies that are in the best interest for their population in the local context. Given the size of the United States, uh, having a centralized government that makes all decisions uh, would not uh, best represent the interest of every different area. So having the decentralized uh, services and policies can help customize plans and programs. It also allows for programs to be pilot tested on a smaller level before rolling out to the nation as a whole. There are many programs in the United States that are designed to help older adults that do exist across the entire country, but many times the programs that actually govern the services are localized. And I'll be talking about some of those. So, so my first major grouping of policies uh, is under the heading of protection. So with advanced age and or physical limitations, older adults may be at increased risk for abuse and neglect. So I want to talk about the Elder Abuse Prevention uh, Program. In every state in the United States, there's a program that's charged with investigating charges of elder abuse and neglect and exploitation. Since it's a state-based program, there are differences by different states and uh, who is served, what the eligibility requirements are, and who are by law required to report abuse. In most states, there's mandatory, mandatory reporters. This idea of there's certain people who are required by law based on their professions uh, or roles in society to report suspected abuse. So if a person uh, in the course of their work uh, is made aware of potential abuse or neglect, they're required to report the concerns to the Adult Protective Services. And it's timed to our professional licenses. So if social work, for example, I'm a social worker, it's tied to my license, and I can also um, be fined by the government if I don't report abuse that I know of. In the United States, without mandatory retirement, uh, mandatory reporting laws, more individuals would turn a blind eye because they don't want to become involved and create problems or uh, damage relationships, concerns, <coughs> those kind of things. 
So these mandatory re reporters include social service agencies, law enforcement personnel, uh, emergency response providers, clergy, financial service providers like banks who might see some of the financial fraud, uh, healthcare, medical, dental providers, etc. mental health providers. So if you're thinking about things like policies related to adult protective services, some of the things um, that the United States is really concerned about is that adult protective services programs have adequate staffing. And I only say this because all too often in the states, there's inadequate staffing levels. So they might have a lot of people, charges being brought forward, but difficulties in uh, following up adequately. It's also really important to have standardized reporting policies and procedures. So it helps to determine what are the risk factors for abuse, identifies um, the guilty parties so that they can't keep on creating um, additional abusive relationships. Uh, adult protective service workers also need adequate training to be able to evaluate and intervene. So that there's consistency in the way that uh, investigations are conducted. So there's a lot more standardization and reporting uh, of child protective services and those allegations in the United States compared to adult protective services. But uh, I think it, they're becoming more standardized as we realize this need. In addition, there's also need for great interagency collaboration and communication. Because, for example, if you find out somebody is abusing an older adult and that's illegal, then law enforcement has to become involved. So if all you're doing is identifying, if all we're doing is identifying perpetrators but then not following up, we fail our older adults. So the uh, ability to work with other agencies is really important uh, to make the system work well. Another way that the United States tries to protect its older adults is through adult guardianship. This is not a new idea. We've around the world had adult guardianship, this idea of, in different ways, trying to take care of people who are either physically unable, unable to take care of themselves because of a disability or mental health condition, um, or perceived uh, being too old or too frail to be able to make decisions for themselves. So in the United States, they use local court systems to be able to help um, appoint somebody else who's legally responsible for helping the, the older adults. And these adult guardianships appointed by the courts vary from state to state. And then they're implemented at the local level, often the county level. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we found in the United States is that uh, there can be some barriers related to, to adult guardianship. Uh, well, guardians are often family members and friends who are entrusted in taking care and making decisions for people in their best interest. Uh, the, the actual implementation be problematic. So in the slide, I talk about some of the different types of guardianships that exist in the Ohio, the state where I live. There's guardianship of the person, which gives the guardian the right to make all, all decisions for a person, including health care. There's a type of guardianship called guardian of the estates, which just is focused on the financial aspects. And then there's limited guardianship, which is related to, uh, has specific rights and responsibilities, but not holistic. And the process of adult guardianship occurs in three steps. There's determining the level of capacity of the older adult. There's stripping away of some or all of the rights of the older person if they're found to have lack competency or need a guardian. And there's appointment of a guardian. And a lot of times guardianship proceedings are initiated by people who are hoping to be named the guardian, but not always. Sometimes it's adult protective services that identify this issue of potential lack of competence, and then somebody has to be named. And sometimes they don't have family members or friends that are willing to step up, step up or able to step up. In that case, sometimes it's uh, other institutions or people in the community who agree to take responsibility for another person. 
And while many guardians take good care and work diligently to protect and provide for their wards, unfortunately, it's not always the case. Sometimes people are unscrupulous uh, and may use the guardianship to take away rights or to abuse the person. So there's been cases when people have been granted guardianship powers and then sold their house and used the profits. For example, sometimes adult children are available and want to be guardians, but this other individual has come in and um, basically committed fraud and conned the person out of their home. Uh, in another case I've heard of, in Ohio, one person had a guardianship over 2,000 older adults, which makes it really hard if you're going to think about being able to know and make the best decisions in the best interest of somebody else, um, and just even visiting them. So Ohio, the state, has tried to re address some of these issues by um, making sure, first of all, that there's ample notice that there's going to be guardianship hearings. Um, you have to have two medical professionals that deem a person to be incompetent before they can, their rights can be taken away. I mean, this is an important idea. Uh, they also have now instituted background checks, criminal background checks, of the potential guardian and the reporting of those results to the court. It's an important loop. Not just that uh, criminal background checks are happening, but that they're reported back. Guardians are now required to visit with their ward at least once every three months or four times a year and submit yearly reports. Uh, and we really try to focus on this idea of person-centered planning. That's part of the requirement of the law now. Um, which takes into, is supposed to take into account the ward's wishes uh, and the preferences in the least restrictive setting possible. So sometimes people would have all these wards and they'd say, okay, the easiest way that I can take care of all of my wards is to immediately try to put them in nursing homes where I can restrict everything. And, um, so it kind of can limit some of the, those abuses. Uh, this idea of the least restrictive setting possible means that wards should be allowed to live independently if possible, rather than being forced to move into a nursing facility. And some local courts go further, in, like Butler County, for example, and they're requiring more training of potential guardians or new guardians, even if they're family members or friends, because uh, especially the financial aspects of guardianship require a lot of knowledge about how do you fill out the forms and what reports need to be filled out and what time frame. So it also can be helpful just to have this idea of person-centered planning. And what does it mean to take into account the person's preferences? Um, so knowledge about guardianship regulations can help guardians be more aware of their responsibilities, how to complete paperwork, and how to represent their ward's best interest. There's also a need for ongoing monitoring or periodic evaluation to make sure that the need for guardianship still exists. Sometimes people may lack capacity to make certain decisions for themselves under a certain health condition, but then they may recover and not need that uh, ongoing um, guardianship. Uh, but all too often, once some guardianship has been established, uh, it's established. So there's a need to, to make sure that we don't just keep this up forever. And it should be an extraordinary situation, not a regular thing that if you reach a certain age, then you're immediately have your rights suspended. So, but even with the best of intentions, sometimes guardians are overly restrictive. There's some research that suggests that determining that a person needs a legal guardian is linked with decline as well, a uh, decline in ability as well as quality of life. This idea that if we're telling people that they are not, uh, that they lack capacity, maybe it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. So one alternative that some states have adopted is called supported decision-making. The states of Texas and Virginia have both passed laws authorizing supported decision-making. And the idea behind that kind of policy is that people should be allowed to make their own decisions with the support of friends or trusted others, like friend, family members, who help them think through various aspects of their uh, potential consequences of action. So, they might be, say, impulsive and want to sell their house and go on a cruise, but maybe say, well, what are you going to, 
help them think about what are they going to do when they get back from the cruise, for example. And most of us actually use supportive decision making all the time in our own personal relationships. And this is a, there's a National Center for Supportive Decision Making in the United States. And it's uh, especially related to people with disabilities. That's the primary population I think that they're representing. But they say people with disabilities have the right to make decisions on their own life. Uh, and then sometimes the guardians might say, oh, you can't see those people and you can't date that person or you can't do all these things, but uh, that we should foster more people's ability to be independent as much as possible. So now I want to switch to the volunteer ombudsman program. In addition to adult guardianship, which is only supposed to occur in uh, extraordinary circumstances, there are other types of programs designed to protect and represent the needs of older adults. This program uh, is, uh, uses volunteers who come in and advocate on behalf of people who are now living in nursing homes or assisted living facilities. And ombudsmen's help individuals who are residents, uh, they can also be members of the community, uh, who have complaints. They investigate complaints. They resolve problems. They regularly visit facilities to make sure that the facility conditions are safe. Um, and they also share information about the needs of individuals with their families, facility administrators, and the communities with the goals of improving conditions for older adults and uh, people with disabilities. Sometimes people who are nurse, residents of nursing homes may not have other people visiting them and seeing um, the conditions they live under. So this is a role um, that they play. So just some examples of changes that have occurred in the United States. Because of involvement of ombudsman programs, um, it resulted in the enactment of the National uh, Nursing Home Reform Law of 1987. Um, residents have personal needs allowances, and that increased that amount so people could have more money to buy um, things like toiletries. Uh, we increased protections from involuntary discharge and room transfers because sometimes people would just be moved from one room to another and they'd say, well, I don't want to be moved from this room or I don't want to be moved into that room. And so it has prevented some of that. It has reduced the use of psychotropic medications in nursing homes. Uh, it's resulted in better uh, licensing, oversight of healthcare professionals, increased the use of advanced directives, increased the competencies of the staff and the sensitivities of the staff, and empowered residents for stronger resident and family governance structures. And it's also increased state funding for inspection and surveying of these long-term care facilities. So those are really impressive outcomes from this policy, um, which has resulted from their advocacy. Unfortunately, there's some barriers that limit, that can limit the effectiveness of these programs, at least under the experience of the United States. Uh, and these include, this, this thing might come up over and over again in my presentation, but lack of sufficient funding at both the state and local levels, lack of professional staff of the investment program. Most of these volunteers, but there's still a few professional staff. So lack of professional staff and uh, the ability of the professional staff to effectively use volunteers. Clear, lack of clear lines of authority and accountability for ombudsmen at all levels, like if you find a problem, who do you report to, how do you follow up on it? And restrictions on program autonomy. So in order for an ombudsman program to be most effective, uh, some of these issues need to be addressed. I was thinking about some of the different protection programs that we have in the United States, and another one of them is uh, an elder alert program. In the United States, we have what we call an Amber Alert, which is when children go missing or kidnapped by somebody. And we have also uh, what is sometimes called the Silver Alert or Senior Alert. So some states have a statewide emergency alert program to help identify and locate missing older adults who are endangered and have a mental, mental capacity impairment or that they meet certain age requirements. So. Under the normal policies for missing persons, somebody has to be missing for two or three days before anything is done by the local law enforcement. 
but uh, if somebody has, say, Alzheimer's, and they're lost, you don't want to wait two or three days to try to start looking for them. So this alert system is designed to take action more quickly. So um, in Ohio, we send out alerts via tweets, text messages, electronic billboards are used, posted on the, the website for the Ohio Department of Aging and, uh, and other locations to try to spread the word and try to find them as soon as possible. So, at least in Ohio, there's this picture that can go along with it, or a physical description saying um, why they are, what their name is, and why they are concerned, and, and where they're asking to try to gain public help. So, as all these information highlights, there's a lot of protections, and these are just some of them, designed to help protect older adults. But, I don't really just focus on that aspect because older adults, they spend a whole lifespan and um, it would be remiss to just focus on that aspect. So I want to talk about engagement. So um, in this section I will talk about lifelong learning, older adults, volunteers, and employment. And I'll also discuss the role of area agencies on aging to promote engagement. So, oh, okay. Lifelong learning. Sorry, the slides are a little bit uh, different uh, than in your packet in terms of order. But so lifelong learning has been defined as a continuing pursuit of knowledge to build skills, explore new ideas, and enhance understanding in a rich life. In the United States, there's many opportunities for lifelong learning that are offered through libraries, local nonprofit organizations, and colleges and universities. At the university where I work, Miami University of Ohio, um, Miami University partners with a local chapter of an organization called the Institute for Learning and Retirement. Chapters are also found in many other universities across the United States, and they offer classes for people who are age 50 and older. And the program participants themselves are required, uh, are the ones that actually plan the activities. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. Older adults each pay a fee uh, for a semester and they can take classes through the institute. So for my local institute for learning and retirement, the fee for, for the semester is $150 for the fall semester. And those who could pay the fee can take as many classes as they like. Uh, many of the participants and teachers from the program are retired faculty members from the university. So, because it's a small college town, um, but they have uh, a wide diversity in types of programs. So during this fall's term, which lasted five weeks, October and the first week of November, the Oxford chapter offered 34 different classes um, from a wide range of topics, including movies, classic literature, health promotion, bird watching, wine tasting, chocolate tasting. It sounded really exciting. Uh, historic events, computer skills, religion and politics, and financial topics. Uh, I know that I am definitely interested in participating when I become eligible because they help so many different things. So this idea of uh, fun, non-homework based classes is one area of lifelong learning. Uh, in addition, they have classes that are offered uh, through universities. Like uh, the state of Ohio has required now that all colleges and universities offer older adults who are 60 and over, who are residents of the state of Ohio, to be able to attend colleges without paying the tuition if there's space in the classroom. And from my personal perspective, I'm really excited about that because I think that more intergenerational communication and learning from each other can really be helpful. And I think just this age diversity in the classroom can be helpful to the young people as well as for the older adult who may be interested in learning a particular topic. Now that may or may not result in college credit for the older adult, the policies change, uh, differ across different programs. Um, but I think that this is a, a neat way that universities can promote engagement and states can promote engagement. So research has found that lifelong learning promotes social engagement and cognitive ability and health. Adult learning not only increases uh, leads to increases in happiness and life satisfaction, self-esteem and self-efficacy. It could also possibly have economic benefits. 
including potentially higher wages and greater employability uh, as people age. So this my plea for lifelong learning. I tell my students that all the time. Please don't think that once you finish with university that you're finished with learning because there's so much to learn and society is continually changing. Uh, we shouldn't stop learning. So I'm going to go back. Another way uh, in, to potentially increase uh, this engagement of older adults is through volunteering. So I'm highlighting one program called the Senior Corps Volunteers Program. There are many opportunities to volunteer in the United States, and I cannot begin to describe all of them. But I decided to focus on the Senior Corps because it's a network of national service programs for Americans aged 55 and, and older across the country. Although it's a national program, it operates within local communities and has many branch uh, offices. So, Senior Corps has three main programs. They foster grandparents, traditional grandparents can serve as role models, mentors, friends to children, but not all children have contact with grandparents. Sometimes grandparents are already deceased or they may live far away. So through Singapore, the individuals can serve as foster grandparents for children with exceptional needs. Volunteers are given modest stipends to help offset the cost of volunteering. I think it's important to realize that volunteering isn't free for the, the volunteer. A lot of times there's transportation costs or other expenses. So I like the fact that this program does provide some modest stipends for that. Um, they also provide insurance and training uh, to help as well. Foster grandparents average 20 hours per week in schools, hospitals, drug treatment centers, correctional institutions, and child care centers. So they serve in a variety of different locations. Another program under Senior Corps is RSVP. This is one of the largest volunteer organizations for people age 55 plus. And they can help in a variety of ways, such as organizing neighborhood watch programs, um, helping those who are impacted by national disasters, helping teach English to immigrants up to the United States, renovating homes, tutoring programs, etc. So for RSVP, instead of being sent to a particular location and told what they were going to do for volunteering, they get to choose themselves. And the mm -hmm. idea is that older adults bring a lot of expertise, and this is designed to help channel and, and support those efforts to help. So time commitments for that program, people get to decide how much time they're going to spend. So from a few hours to, to 40 hours a week, uh, they get to decide. And then uh, the third group of uh, heading is senior companions. Older adults who volunteer through senior companion programs provide assistance and friendship to other older adults who have difficulties with activities of daily living tasks, such as shopping or paying bills. They also work an average of 20 hours per week, like the foster grandparent program. And most of those volunteering with senior companions occur in people's homes. And they do receive a modest stipend as well, this training insurance. So these programs are beneficial for the volunteers, as volunteering can promote a host of positive outcomes, including better health promotion, physical health, emotional health, cognitive ability, social engagement, as well as reduce social isolation and loneliness, which are things that we think about as gerontologists all the time, of how can we help some of these, promote some of these outcomes. Um, so volunteering has is, is been found really promising. Uh, the individuals and communities that the volunteers serve also benefit. So it's a win-win for society. <laughs> Older adults bring a wealth of expertise and experience, and it makes sense for local governments to try to find ways to organize and facilitate meaningful volunteer opportunities for older adults, especially structured ones. And people might volunteer and help a friend here or there, but um, we can help uh, foster a whole cohort of people who have support. And I think that that uh, can be beneficial. So, while some people choose to engage in uh, society through volunteering, other older adults want to continue in, in paid employment, or they need to continue working for financial reasons. The United States may eliminated its mandatory retirement policies for most professions back in 1986, so there's a lot of flexibility for remaining engaged in the labor force. 
But I do want to say, in the United States, we talk about this idea of incentives for continuing to work longer. But continued employment is not always possible. Despite the fact that it's against the law to discriminate against individuals over the age of 40 in recruitment, hiring, training, and retention, middle-aged, older adults, middle-aged and older adults still often experience challenges in remaining in the labor force. So to meet this need, uh, several programs have been established to help address the issue. So the Back to Work 50 plus program targets Americans aged 50 and older with information, support, training, and employer access that they need to regain employment, advance in the workforce, and build financial capacity and resilience to prevent them from slipping into poverty later in life. So there's more than 20 programs in the United States, uh, more than 20 sites across the United States for this program. Uh, in addition to the standard unemployment offices that serve all ages. Another program for employment is called the Senior Community Service Employment Program. And they exist across the United States and provide paid employment training to older workers to help them become or remain uh, competitive in the labor market. Uh, program evaluation results found that participants enjoyed important social and emotional results as uh, benefits for being part of the program. And although it's primarily an employment program, many participants also spoke of improved mental and physical health because of their involvement in the program and their community service assignments. Most respondents value the training programs that they're participating in because it helps them learn new skills. And sometimes we think, employers may think that older adults are not interested in learning new skills, but I think more and more, you know, that's not what older workers often are saying. They want to learn new skills and remain competitive, especially if they're motivated to remain in the labor force. Uh, and I'll come back to that. So um, participants said that it, they were really found it helpful, the, the help they found in terms of resume building, um, highlighting their relevant skills, um, which jobs to target, etc. So unfortunately though, this funding source and the organizational structure means that the, because a lot of funding comes from the federal government, so the funding goes up and down. So the availability of the program is not always there. Um, participants in the program evaluation participants said that they thought that the budget cuts, cuts have seriously impacted the ability of the program to meet their training needs uh, in just slots in the program. I know that I encouraged my husband's aunt to apply to this program a few years ago because she was unemployed and she wanted to be working, um, but at the time they weren't accepting any new applications in, in her state, and she ultimately gave up her goals to be employed because she was just finding so many barriers to employment. So another, another concern related to this program is the potential loss of public benefits because in the United States, if somebody might be receiving medical assistance, housing assistance, uh, food stamps, etc., to help meet their basic needs, and if they graduate from the, the program and they find a job is uh, not through this training program, once they graduate, uh, they might potentially lose those benefits. So there's these concerns about some of the unintended consequences for participants and a desire to learn more about what the consequences might be. Not all participants want to look for employment, so some people are ending up in this training program, um, but not actually sharing the goal of the, the program for the outcome. So, uh, I've talked about Back to Work 50 and the CSEP, but I also want to mention about programs like Backdrop. Uh, the Missouri, a few years ago, had a program that was a deferred retirement incentive program for its state employees. In the state of Missouri, there's a lot of older adults uh, who are reaching the age, middle-aged and older adults, but who've been working for the state of Missouri for a long time, who are near the age of a retirement eligibility. So what they did was they uh, took part in this program called uh, Backdrop. There's also Drops and Pops and, and different retirement incentive programs um, with some different structures. But the idea was to try to retain the current workers that they had with this thought of um, 
sometimes the younger generation in the United States is not so interested in working for the state. Uh, so there's this different culture shift in the United States. Uh, also, it's expensive to train new workers and uh, to recruit them and train them. So um, there's different incentives <coughs> to retain them. Uh, and of course, the idea is do we retain the people that we are wanting to retain? Are there certain professions like firefighters who we might be able to have longer, but otherwise might be diverted out? I talked to one gentleman who said, I signed up for this delayed retirement incentive program because uh, this way I can benefit and that's something that I can uh, pass on to my children. So it added to his retirement um, package. And um, anyway, unfortunately though, it ended up becoming a political football and uh, they've eliminated it in Missouri, but other states continue to use it. Uh, the program gave a one lump sum payment which was actually really neutral, but there was perceptions that we were rewarding people, um, and that wasn't something they wanted to continue on in the state. So, uh, when you meet eligibility for retirement pensions in the United States, then the incentive is to go somewhere else, to work in another organization, or to retire because you don't have this. You can build up retirement savings perhaps somewhere else. So these the bit delayed retirement incentives can be really helpful in keeping people. So another option that employers are using is to offer more flexibility in retirement, such as gradual retirement options where the individual might gradually cut down their amount of hours work or their responsibilities over time rather than having an abrupt end to employment. So while we're talking about employment, I just want to acknowledge that not everybody wants to extend the number of years that they're working. I mean, I think a lot of times policymakers talk about that. We need to extend the working life. We need to extend the working life. And not only is there ageism in employment and a structural lag in what policymakers might want versus what employers might want and individuals might want, um, but also some professions are more challenging than others. Uh, in terms of uh, physically demanding or very stressful. Uh, sometimes people might feel like they've worked so many hours for so long and they're ready for a change. And especially if we want people to shift to other things like potentially um, volunteering or caregiving for older adults or, or a variety of things that we might find beneficial in society. We have to think about do we want to put in the United States, do we want to put all of our eggs in one basket in terms of employment and employment? employment? So, this, all these different aspects have to be taken into account by policymakers who wish to promote extended working lives. I, um, I kind of personally favor the uh, rewarding and incentivizing continued working rather than penalizing people for not continuing to, to work. So, this is kind of an abrupt transition, I don't have a good one, but area agencies on aging uh, is another way that uh, local governments have used to try to promote engagement of older adults. Area agencies on aging were established in 1973 under the Older Americans Act, and all of the older Amer uh, agencies, area agencies on aging receive federal funding, um, but it's really a local program. There's approximately 620 triple A's nationwide that provide services to people age 60 and over. And most of the triple A's serve a specific geographic area, such as several neighboring counties, although a few triple A's offer um, programs statewide. Triple A's facilitate local decision making to meet local priorities as well as the local provision of services. Each area agency on aging provides different services based on their local needs. I think that's really important. But there's some basic services that are provided by nearly all of them. So these include nutrition, caregiver support, information and referral to the different resources that are available, uh, the long-term care and budsman program they administer, uh, insurance, counseling, uh, talking about Medicare options, transportation, uh, and uh, so they might be providing transportation to different medical services, et cetera. So um, when I was 
preparing this slide, so I really wondered, should I put this under engagement or under community support and inclusion, which is the next section. So, um, other types of community support and inclusion are designed to help change an entire community to be more inclusive in nature. These strategies include age-friendly communities, dementia-friendly communities, housing and zoning regulations, and caregiver support programs. Uh, so, the age-friendly communities, uh, AARP Network of Age-Friendly Communities is affiliated with the World Health Organization of Age-Friendly Cities and Communities Programs, international uh, effort, the United States is participating in. I know Seoul, Korea is designated as an age-friendly city, so it's, this isn't uh, new to you. But um, I, I like the idea of age-friendly communities because it requires that there's um, political backing and support. And thinking about ways that communities can become, uh, reduce barriers and make uh, cities more age-friendly uh, by providing access to health services, transportation. Um, there's also a lot of different toolkits that are available um, to help organizations do that. Um, and uh, there's different examples about um, cities that have designed action plans uh, to, to figure out where are the barriers and um, what can be done about them. So, um, cities and community planners have worked to change uh, zoning laws that change, separate residential areas from business areas. That's a big problem in the United States where we keep the two separate. And if you're not, if you lack mobility or if you lack transportation in other ways, then it can be difficult to get to the grocery store, for example, to get to health services. So um, that's one area that, that has been used. Um, the planners, city planners can do things like um, changing the environment to make sidewalks safer. A lot of times, sidewalks can become in disrepair, makes walking challenging or dangerous. Uh, there can also be other safety issues related to proper lighting where people don't feel safe to walk. So there's a variety of things that in the local government context, older uh, local governments can do to help improve uh, their community. So, along with age-friendly communities, there's dementia-friendly, it's new to the United States, not new to the world. Um, and the goal is to reduce stigma of dementia which is really a, a challenge, and also to just uh, provide awareness about um, some of the early warning signs, become, uh, have society become more inclusive of older people. And they're more prospective, prescriptive about how uh, programs, uh, cities should be. So like who needs to be part of this discussion is more prescribed in dementia-friendly communities, but there's a, uh, thoughts about why don't we combine the two? Why don't we say we should become age friendly and dementia friendly? So there's also <coughs> online tools and resources available. But I mean, there can be simple things like uh, increasing the visual distinction in restrooms so that there's a, a different colored toilet lid versus toilet seat to help people with dementia be able to, to use public facilities better. So that's some of the ideas, one of the ideas that are real. So one of the things that I noticed when I was looking at the Korean Geological Society is that one of the list of professions that's part of the membership is architects. So I wanted to talk about housing specifically. Um, one of the ways that local governments in the United States work to help its older adult population is through various housing policies. Um, so older populations face numerous housing challenges, such as affordability, physical accessibility, uh, and then just access to services. And we have a lot of seniors who are living in rural areas in the United States, so they face a lot of challenges, unique challenges, like access to resources, um, just distance to neighbors. So affordability is addressed through some of the public housing programs that provide subsidized assistance for low-income older adults. And they're administered by federal, state, and local agencies. 
Some are restricted to just older adults, some are more intergenerational. Uh, accessibility is a different challenge. In the United States, very few homes or apartments are accessible for people with disabilities. According to one statistic, fewer than 4% of U.S. residential units are suitable for people with moderate mobility disabilities, and only 1% of units are wheelchair accessible. Uh, I know I went traveling with my mom, who was in a wheelchair at the time, and just traveling and trying to find a hotel that was accessible in the United States was really a challenge and requires a lot more planning. So uh, one local government in the state of Maine tried to help its older adult population by just sending out public housing maintenance staff to do just minor things like um, testing smoke alarms, cleaning up dryer vents, and then installing grab bars and railings and things like that to help improve accessibility. And the state of, of the city of St. Louis in Missouri uh, encouraged the development of more accessible housing by requiring that all cities, uh, all new uh, housing that's funded by the affordable uh, housing funds <coughs> Uh, should follow universal design principles, which includes things like using levers instead of knobs, which is uh, can be good for a lot of people, not just older adults. So it also includes things like wide doorways, step-free entryways, um, and uh, they call it universal design because it can be good for variety of people. So in the United States, there continues to be a decline in the number of older adults who live with their children. This can impact the availability of assistance with personal care tasks as well as general activities and shopping. Um, however, you know, at the Gerontological Society of America conference last month, I heard a presentation by Jersey Lang, and he found that of the United States older adults in his study, 40% uh, of them were living in close proximity to their children, although not with their children. And that really makes it an interesting thought to me about what do we mean about older adults and maybe there's ways to foster independence as well as assistance and the support. So to facilitate one type of proximate living arrangement, the city of Philadelphia revised its zoning, zoning codes to legalize accessory dwellings, which is a secondary house or apartment on the building of a primary house, because a lot more people in the United States live in houses as opposed to apartments. I know I have a friend who lives, who just got an apartment, and she, her apartment and her mom's apartment are next door. So they're in separate units. Um, and then she comes over for breakfast and supper every day. And so they're able to be together, but separate. Which I thought was interesting. Other communities are promoting development of co-housing or villages. Co-housing are communities that are built with common spaces for social activities. They're playing in common spaces, as well as the private areas. And villages are member organizations that coordinate services such as transportation, social gatherings and outings, and grocery shopping for its residents. So this is the idea of we, we all work together. So state and local governments can also play a role in distributing information to provide uh, help to uh, caregivers of older adults, which can help with the engagement of both the older adult and their caregiver. So the Ohio Department of Aging, for example, has a toolbox for caregivers to help them think about their own self-care, planning, issues, and communication. So this does lead to the area of uh, medical, and I know I'm really, I'm running really late. Um, the United States has a Medicaid program which is designed to provide medical assistance to low-income older adults who meet eligibility requirements. It's very, very low income, something like $2,000 worth of assets off in different states. So it's a very low income and, and uh, wealth. Uh, and Medicaid eligibility services vary from state to state, but they provide care for things like skilled nursing homes, um, lab services, x-rays, doctor visits, surgeries, uh, um, for people who meet this, this eligibility. <coughs> and some people get services both from Medicaid and Medicare, um, and then they can use both programs. <coughs> Um, care options include home care, home delivered, home and community-based service waivers to help people remain in their home rather than moving to nursing homes, and long-term care. And there are some program evaluation studies of Medicaid, which is a state-based program, who found promising results with respect to reduced hospitalizations and a 
emergency department use, and Medicaid spending. So I'm providing just one example of a Medicaid waiver program. Uh, so in Ohio, there's this passport program, and the slide lists a whole host of different type of services that people can get through um, uh, passport. Passport is an acronym for pre-admission screening system providing options and resources today. That's what it means. And people can be part of Passport if their care will be at least 60%, no more than 60% of the cost of going to a nursing home. They, they need nursing home care, but they're not going into nursing home care. They're being able to stay at home in the community, um, which a lot of older adults say that they prefer to do. So it results in cost savings for the individual, or for the, the government, as well as uh, a preference for older adults. So this passport program has some unique features, like allowing the older adult to have consumer direction of services. So it lets the beneficiary say who's going to come provide services, and friends and certain family members are allowed to be the paid providers, not the spouses, but adult children can be hired to provide some of this care. It doesn't pay tons of money, it's like 10 to $14 an hour, but they get compensated for what they're already doing, and again, it's still cheaper than what they were paying in a nursing home. Eligibility for passport includes very low income and assets because it's part of the Medicaid program. The ability to live in the community if you have these supportive services and being age 60 or over. But as it's a state-based program, the availability of waivers varies from state to state, and sometimes even within particular parts of the state. There can also be very long waiting lists for this program because there's a lot of uh, desire for programs that let people remain in their homes longer. So most of the programs that I've discussed in this presentation, most of the programs that I've discussed in this presentation require funding of some type. Sometimes the funding is necessary for staffing of the programs, but other programs require expenditures such as funding Medicaid services. So I'm just concluding with this local government tax levy. In the United States, the government raises a lot of its funds through income taxes and property taxes. In some states, local governments, such as cities and counties, raise additional funds to pay for some of these services through tax levies, which are time-limited property taxes that are designated for a certain purpose. So I have a program evaluation about Ohio that's related to um, tax levies. In 2009, more than 106, $166 million were raised in property, property tax funds just in Ohio to help older people in Ohio be able to live in their own homes and communities. And there's 15 different states that uh, use these tax levies, and this amount was the highest in Ohio compared to other states. There's a lot of support. A lot of money spent, actually, in PR campaigns that come that help the general public realize the importance and what the money is used for, for older adults. In Butler County, where I live, the tax levy funds uh, the senior services program, which means in-home care needs like housekeeping, help, bathing, and grouping, grooming of the county's older adults. And they're the payer of last resort. These are people who are not eligible for other services, so it helps fill this gap um, to, to pay for some of these services. So, oops. Um, as this presentation highlights, there are many programs and services designed to support older adults in the United States. However, there's always more that could be done to support older adults. For the most part, policymakers realize that they need to focus on older adult population to benefit these older adults and their families as well as society in a whole. Come <laughs>